I want to uh, discuss the cutely named NMR technique, inadequate, which is a really powerful technique for elucidating molecular skeletons, for elucidating carbon-carbon skeletons. And then I also want to talk a little bit about use of molecular models to complement our, uh, our NMR experiments as we get into the last couple of homework sets in strychnine, we're dealing with some really beautiful molecules, some bicyclic structures and other structures with interesting shapes where the nuclear overhauser effect is going to be important in determining stereochemistry and just understanding the diastereomers that we're creating rightly or wrongly is going to be very valuable and three-dimensional molecular models are going to be helpful I know James introduced these during the jam session. I talked a little bit about them at various times during my office hours, but I wanted a chance for everyone as a class to see them. So we'll probably have time for that. So the inadequate experiment stands for incredible natural abundance double quantum experiment. NMR spectroscopists always like to make up uh, interesting names for their experiments. And this is, this is one that serves that, um, that purpose of having an interesting name. It's essentially a carbon-carbon cozy. And you can imagine why this technique is going to be very powerful for elucidating carbon-carbon skeletons, because we have the potential and the promise to get every carbon linked to every other carbon. You do this indirectly in the COSY experiment, but of course in the COSY experiment, we've already seen the pain of overlap where you just get into a quagmire of overlapping peaks and you really can't work your way out or work your way through, or you have some allylic couplings that maybe are confusing to you, so you're not quite sure of the connectivity. So a carbon-carbon cozy sounds like the ideal experiment to do. Um, it's very powerful. But we have the obvious problem. It's a carbon-13 technique, and it requires lots of sample. Now, if you're already, and by lots, I mean, uh, for example, e.g. Uh, 100 mg for a small molecule. So the examples I'm talking about today and I'm going to show you are molecules that are C10 molecules. So obviously, if you had a C20 molecule, the experiment would take either four times as long, because remember, signal to noise drops off as the square root of constant concentration. Or to put it another way, if you, you can either, if you have your concentration, it takes four times as long to signal to noise goes as the square of concentration. So if you have your concentration, it takes four times as long to collect the spectrum. But that also means that if we had a C20 molecule, your molar concentration would be roughly half as big. So it would take four times as long. And we're often talking days or, or even longer uh, to collect an NMR spectrum. So often, days to collect an NMR spectrum. 
And often you have to add a relaxation agent, meaning you need to contaminate your sample. So often you need to, to add uh, something like chromium-3 ACTAC. Basically, relaxation allows the magnetization to return to the z-axis. And with carbons, particularly quarks, it can take 10 seconds for the relaxation time or thereabouts for a quad. It can take very long. So you end up needing a lot of sample, a lot of time, uh, and contaminating your sample. So this is one that I would love to do for strychnine, but we're not going to do it. And this really is, is the problem is that I'm going to show you sort of the killer app and you can't have it, or at least you can't have it for something, something ordinary. Now, maybe if nobody's on the spectrometer and James were very curious, he'd try it setting it up over the Thanksgiving day, but I think even that would piss people off if he started the night before and came in the morning after Thanksgiving, because I suspect some people are going to still be wanting to get on the cryo, cryo 500. So the reason this is such a killer experiment is you've got to have two C13s next to each other, right? We do lots of C13 experiments, but those experiments rely on the fact that you've got a 1% or 1.1% natural abundance. But the odds of having the two carbons next to each other, then both being C13 are 1.1% of 1.1%, so 1.1% of 1.1% is about 0.01%. So in other words, it's 100 times less probable or 90, 90 plus times less probable that you'll have two C13s next to each other. And it gets worse from there. All the nice experiments that we've been doing that involve the 2D experiments that involve carbon. So I'm talking HMQC, HMBC are all proton detected experiments. Now in a proton detected experiment, you're getting the benefit of the proton sensitivity. So you're getting the benefit of the four times roughly higher Boltzmann distribution of the protons, the four times uh, bigger, mag uh, bigger magnetic vector, bigger gyromagnetic ratio of the proton, and the four times greater precession speed. In other words, you're getting about a 64-fold enhancement of your 1.1%, which makes HMBC and HMQC very accessible techniques. In a carbon detected experiment, you don't get that benefit. And then it gets 100 times worse because your neighbor has to be a C13. So it's a very bad experiment. Nevertheless, it is so powerful. I want you to get a taste of it. We're going to have two homework problems derived from it. One of them I'm going to take you through either partially or complete, completely. So I think I sent James an email late last night and said, we should add these to the current homework. So if you've already downloaded the current homework, I'm adding at least one, if not two problems, uh, or at least, at least uh, a Silverstein problem. And James and I will talk, maybe there's another Toxie problem that I should add to it, in part because this homework and the last homework all, both are big sets and I want to make sure they're, they're reasonably balanced and reasonably contemporary. And then as we come into the, the homeworks for the course, our final homework, which is due concurrent with the exam, is to work your way through all those spectra on strychnine. 
And this is a really important capstone for the course. In fact, a couple of years, we've even had derivatives of strychnine as one of the final exam problems. So if you've done this, you know, I don't know what we're doing on the final exam this year, but if you've done this, you may find that the final exam goes really, really easy for you. So that's an important problem. Okay, so back to the technique that I can't give you an example of. So we said it's essentially like a carbon-carbon cozy. There are two variants that are commonly used for the experiment involving slightly different pulse sequences and slightly different data processing. One variant looks like a cozy. And I think you get that in problem 8.39 of Silverstein, if I remember correctly, although I may be wrong. The other variant, which I'll show you today and focus on, but it's, they're just different ways of interpreting the, the data. The other variant has what's called a double quantum axis. So the F1 axis is not a carbon-13 spectrum, and I'll show you how to interpret that. All right, any questions in terms of the setup on this or anything related to today's, today's lecture? All right, I think what I would like to do at this point is dive right into one of the handouts and just work our way through the, uh, the du a double quantum access version of the experiment and then maybe at least show you, um, show you the other variant of the experiment. So let me, let me go ahead. I'll share the screen with you to my iPad. All right, so this is a, an inadequate spectrum of a molecule that's an alcohol with 10 carbons in it and it has one degree of unsaturation. So let me, so that means our formula is C10. It would be of course, if it were saturated H22, but with one degree of unsaturation it has a molecular formula C10H20O. And as I said, there's a carbon to which an oxygen is attached. I've taken this example from Koji Nakanishi's book, which I, which I like very much. And we've used for a couple of examples in the course, like the Toxy, Toxy Rosie example. And sometimes what I do on that is just strip out the pre-done interpretation to show you. So just as we've done in our other 2D experiments, um, we will take a separate 1D experiment and plot those on the axes or at least on one axis. This is what we call our double quantum axis. So this direction, which is you know our F1 dimension is our double quantum. I don't think I can write off the edge of the page here. So I have to sort of break my words, double quantum axis here. And this axis here then our F2 dimension is our carbon 13 dimension. We've plotted the 1D, Nakanishi has plotted the 1D spectrum. And I wanna show you this notation here. This is basically an old notation from carbon-13 NMR where you would do what's called an off-resonance decoupled experiment where you would partially irradiate the protons so that carbons with one hydrogen 
would split into a doublet. In other words, a methine would be a doublet. Carbons with two hydrogens attached would split into a triplet. So a methyl methylene group would be a triplet. And carbons with three hydrogens attached, i.e. a methyl group, would be a uh, quartet. So the last three ones are all methyl groups here. And then what I've done for, for our whole course is say we're always going to deal with numbering our peaks in the carbon dimension. If we had peaks in the proton dimension, we'd letter our peaks. So this is peak one, peak two, peak three, peak four, peak five, peak six, peak seven, eight, nine, 10. So here we are with our, um, with our inadequate spectrum. And what I want you to first see is along the double quantum axis, we get these pairs of little, um, little lines. And these pairs are separated. We're in the carbon dimension here. And these pairs are actually separated by J1CC. So in other words, this distance between the lines here is actually our carbon-carbon coupling, which is kind of cool. Carbon-carbon coupling constants are I think on the order of about 20 Hertz, if I remember correctly. So this book, I think all the spectra were done on a 360 megahertz proton NMR spec, uh, spectrometer, which means 70, uh, which means 90 megahertz in the carbon NMR spectrum. So 20 hertz would be about two ninths, about 0.2 uh, ppm apart in our chemical shift. And that looks about right, maybe 0.2 or 0.3. It may be more like 30 hertz. I don't, uh, off the top of my head, remember exactly the, the C1, C1 couplings. I uh, C13, C13 couplings. I think they're about 20 or 30 hertz. Now, the thing about each of these lines is if you look across, there's a partner. And that partner is its coupling partner. In other words, this and this mean these two lines are coupled to each other. These two carbon resonances are coupled to each other. And that's the power of inadequate because we're going to get the whole spectrum built up this way. Um, the double quantum axis is essentially the sum of the frequencies of the two resonances. So it runs diagonally across the spectrum. Here, we're going to see it going slanting downwards to the right. In the other one, we'll see it, uh, the other example, we'll see it slanting downward to the left. But you can very clearly see your double quantum axis because we can see that these two lines here are sort of symmetrically disposed. And these two lines are symmetrically disposed, or I'm not saying this very well, but what I mean is if you look at this and we run a diagonal we'll see that about that diagonal, these two lines, and it doesn't have to be to the corners of the spectrum, it's how you plot it, but basically these two lines are symmetrically disposed around this line that I've drawn between them, if I've drawn it accurately, if I've drawn a straight line. Now that's very valuable because I already said that we're limited on signal to noise ratio. And so if you have a noisy spectrum and I'll go ahead and pretend to make some noise here by let's say going and putting like this over here, I'll take these marks away in a second, but you notice that these two marks aren't symmetrically disposed around that diagonal we'd say, oh, we can go ahead and ignore them. They're just noise. And we'll see an example of that in the next, in the next crud, in the next uh, example from the, the homework set in uh, problem 8.38. All right, so back to our analysis of the spectrum. 
So this ends up being really easy because this cross peak, and of course the first time you see it, it won't be easy, but, but as you get used to it, you'll be, it'll be really easy because you look at this cross peak and you can see this is carbon six with carbon 10. So this cross peak corresponds to six to 10, this pair of peaks here. So six to 10 is really, really useful because that means that we have a methine group, C6H, and it's coupled to a methyl group, C10H3. So we've started to build our molecule. Now we continue again and we see that C6 is connected to something else. C6 is connected to carbon nine. And we say, oh, that's really nice. Carbon six is connected to carbon nine, which is a methyl group. So we've built up an isopropyl group. Isopropyl groups aren't the surprise in a C10 compound. I love terpenes. Other people love terpenes for NMR examples. They're beautiful natural products. Terpenes are built up of isoprene units. A C10 compound is called a monoterpene. That's the nomenclature because you have two isoprene units. So this is an isoprene unit and a monoterpene is biosynthetically built up from two of these units. Often the precursor, the chemical precursor is an alcohol that then undergoes a cation pi cyclization often as the pyrophosphate. So these are darlings of NMR spectra. Uh, if you have three isoprene units, you have what's called a sesqui terpene. Sesqui means one and a half. If you have four isoprene units, so now C20, you have a diterpene. Anyway, we have a monoterpene here. So it's not surprising that this isopropyl, this isobutylene group becomes an isopropyl group in the cation pi cyclization. Okay, we can continue along in our cyclis, in our identifying cross peaks. And I'll just go ahead and make a few more horizontal lines like so to help me keep track of who's partnered, partnered with who. And I'll go ahead and I'll start to identify these off the carbon NMR spectrum. So it looks like this next one is to carbon eight. So that's carbon five to eight. It looks like our next one is to, uh, to carbon seven. And that looks like it's carbon four. So four to seven. Our next one continues to be with carbon four, but it's carbon four to carbon five. And I haven't, just to, to be uh, sort of anchored here, I haven't really been able to anchor any of these fragments, but I come to the next one and I anchor two to seven, or I get this is carbon two and that's to carbon seven. And that's nice because if I'm just sitting here, then I can sort of put the pieces in carbon two to, to seven and that's a methine. Oops, uh, I'm sorry, carbon, oops, I think I got ahead of myself here. We will just <laughs> finish this up here. I'll do one more. That's carbon two to carbon six. Okay, so finally, at least I've sort of been able to build on and then I can, can continue. I mean, not that I couldn't have just started to tabulate these elsewhere, but since I knew I'd get the whole carbon skeleton of the molecule, I figured I'd just sit and, sit and bide my time for the right data to come in. Okay, so two 
connects to seven and seven is a CH2 group. And now I can continue to build up my puzzle um, two connected to six, two connected to seven, seven connected to four, I see right over here. So seven to four, C4, H2, C4 is also a CH2 group. And then four, where does that connect? Um, four connects, oh yeah, four connects to five and five is a CH group. Okay, so C5H, and then let's see. Okay, and five also connects to eight. That's nice. So C8 is a methyl group. And let's see, where do we go from here? I've used my five to eight, my four to seven, my four to five, my two to seven, my two to six. So I guess I better get get some more peaks here. And we come to some cross peaks off of two and three. So this one I had identified before was carbon one to two. And this is carbon one to three. And I said, I have an alcohol. Now I always urge you to pay attention to chemical shifts. Look at the chemical shift of carbon number one. It's at 71 ppm. That's going to be the carbon with the oxygen attached. I told you it was an alcohol. So we have that carbon with the alcohol attached. So that's nice. Okay. Carbon number five connects. Oh, did I miss one? Uh, oh, yeah. One more right over here that I didn't catch right standing here. All right, carbon number three connects to carbon number five. And carbon number five, I said, was a CH, uh, CH, oops, oh no, I did, I did, oh, right, carbon three to carbon five, and three is a CH2 group. So, and then carbon number three connects to carbon number one. And I already decided that carbon number one had a hydrogen and an OH group. And finally, carbon number one connects to carbon number two. In other words, just by identifying these, these pairings off of the double quantum axis, we've built up the entire spectrum, uh, the entire skeleton of the molecule. That's really powerful because it essentially share, blew away everything. We didn't have to assign protons. We didn't have to deal with a cozy. We didn't have to deal with overlap. Now you notice we still have some questions of stereochemistry. We don't know that. If we now went to our proton NMR, we'd be able to figure out what hydrogens are axial, what hydrogens are equatorial, and what diastereomer we had here. We'd be able to build a model and do that. But here we are. We have the entire skeleton of the molecule. We would just use coupling constants and possibly NOEs to assign our stereochemistry. So I think this is a good time to stop and to take questions. Um, do we just have a single bond between C2 and C6? Because it looks like they only have three bonds. Oh, there we go. I saw There's that. a hydrogen on C2. And so these are methines, right? So basically the methine has four valencies on it. So yeah, so the short answer is, yeah, I think there is just a single bond. I know a single bond. Other questions? All right, I wanna take us in through another few, um, few 
comments on the technique. So again, this is from Nakanishi's book. The molecule that he gave you was menthol, which is available in massive quantities um, and is, is highly soluble. And so it was a great example for this book. Here's a little bit of a reading on this. And what Nakanishi did then was he also plotted. So here's the spectrum we worked off and the pulse sequence. Remember I said that, that a 1D NMR or a 2D NMR is basically pulse weight. And I said that's a little bit of a simplification because we get sort of one, we will get one, we get that weight is split into two pieces. Um, and then there's some additional, um, additional weights in here. And then we pulse again, some additional pulses. And then we pulse and then we observe. And so the, the weights and particularly this weight, which we increment called T1, that weight gives rise to the double quantum axis, which is our F1 axis. And then the observe gives rise to this axis, which is our, so that's our T2, and that gives rise to our F2. The pulse sequence for the cozy-like version of the spectrum is slightly different, but the overall outcome is the same. So you use a slightly different pulse sequence the outcome is you get the information now where your F1 axis is not your double quantum axis, but it's also a C13 axis and you get cozy like cross peaks across the, uh, across the spectrum. So anyway, that's what I wanted to show you on that. Um, I wanted to take us to one problem and this is problem 8.38. And I know this one ends up, even when we've done this as a, an exercise together in class, this ends up being a particularly challenging pe uh, spectrum, a particularly pro challenging problem for people. And I thought I would guide us, guide us through it either fully or partially, depending on how our, our time goes today. So if we look at, in this one, we look at our spectrum, we see in the, I, first of all, we see this is our M plus, it's an EI mass spectrum. In our IR, we see what looks like an OH group. And also it looks like we probably have an even number of nitrogens. So probably even, I'll put parenthesis zero, nitrogen. I'm gonna hit. We'll see in a moment, we just don't have room for nitrogen. We see a peak here at 1612. This could be a carbon-carbon double bond. It could also be maybe a carbon neal that's like super conjugated. We'll see what's, what's doing this in the end. But anyway, let's go and take it through the rest of the, the spectrum. If we look at our proton NMR, we see a big broad OH group over here. It looks like based on our integrals, we see one hydrogen here and one hydrogen here and something that's twice as high, two hydrogens and one hydrogen. And I put a ruler on this and this was six hydrogens. If I label our peaks, it's A, B, C, D, E, I think one of the things that people have found confusing on this problem, so it's, it's clear that E looks like a doublet. And unfortunately, I think we have a little bit of bad shimming here. All the peaks are a little bit broad. I think this is just what we call split field. In other words, this is not a doublet of doublets. It's really a doublet. Uh, so that may help out. Okay, we see something that looks like a septet here. Corresponding to this peak here. It probably doesn't take too much imagination to think maybe we have an isopropyl group here. Um, 
clearly with six hydrogens here, we have, um, we have two methyls that are the same. And as I said, that's not a real splitting or diastereotopicity to it. So I think, I think that's probably just a product of bad, bad shimming. But if we go to the carbon NMR and we try to try to count our way through the carbons, we get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a methyl group here. And I've already said that we have six hydrogens. So it's got to be got to be two methyl groups. So at that point, if we worked our way up to a formula and we've said, well, we've got to have two carbons to accommodate this, we've got to have a C10 molecule. And if we've worked our way up on all those hydrogens, we're up to H12. And we know we have, so that alone would be 132. We know we have at least one oxygen because I said, I'm pretty sure I have an OH in there. And that leaves, if you take 164 minus 132 and 116, or minus 60, that's down to 16 left, which means we almost certainly have two oxygens, which kind of comes back to what I was saying about a, a carbonyl group likely being present here. If we work out our degrees of unsaturation, right, if it were C10, it would be H22, but it's H12, so we're 10 hydrogen shy or five degrees of unsaturation. If you prefer to just plug and chug in the formula, you can do the same thing, but regardless, that means that we've got some combination of rings, double bonds, carbonyls, totaling up to um, totaling up to five. Okay, if we go and use my sort of usual approach of trying to work our way through the the HMQC and then the cozy, we don't get very far. So here we start, and we have to keep track. We started at carbon number four five, six, and the reason, by the way, we did that was carbons one, two, and three are all quats, so we didn't expect anything. So the, uh, the Silverstein textbook just started us out here at four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We can kind of correlate. We have our peaks A, which is two hydrogens, B, C, D, E. We can kind of correlate here and carbon number nine goes with E and carbon number eight goes with D. And then if we kind of finagle our way, we've got an expansion of this region here to help us out. So we've got six, seven, eight, um, am I right? Uh, uh, no, that's not right. We've got four, five, six, seven over here. And if we kind of finagle our way through our A, our B, and our C, we find that uh, four and six are basically lumped on top of A. We find that six, uh, that seven is connected to B and we find that five is connected to C. We get into the cozy and we'll do what I always do, which is we do four, six, A, we do seven, B, we do five, C, we do eight, D, we do nine, C, and if you hadn't, or nine, E, if you hadn't already figured, right, we'll just take our, we'll draw our diagonal. For the cozy, and if you hadn't already figured, I sort of hinted in an isopropyl, we've got 8D with 9C, 9E, and that explains our isopropyl group, right? That's our two methyls.
I guess I'd write it as H3E. Let me neaten that up as best as I can on this little writing surface. All right, so we get our isopropyl group. We don't get any cross peaks with all of these, what look like double bond carbons here. And I don't know, maybe, maybe we can kind of, kind of make our way into some of these cross peaks or use the expansion. We've got four slash six A to seven B. We've got 7B to 5C, but we're not, we're not getting that far. And at this point, at this point, you'd pretty much with these data be stuck. And so we come over, we come over to our spectrum here. And we get to our point, and this is where, again, we have our double quantum axis. In this particular case, um, it run our pairs of peaks. You can kind of see them paired up here symmetrically. So you can kind of see these two, that's our isopropyl group, pair up symmetrically. If you look hard, you can see that one and two are actually paired up symmetrically here you can start to see a few other, oops, a few other symmetrical pairs. And so you can start to see, okay, if we drew our, wow. If we drew our diagonal here. There's just this line that we, <laughs> my iPad is a little, little too happy today. A little too sensitive. We drew that that diagonal, we'd start to see we have eight to nine. We have, if we work over here, they've kind of helped us out here with this line here. They said that's eight to three. This is just our peaks that we're gonna number. And we can ignore these because they're not symmetrically disposed about the axis. And then they basically take this region over here in Silverstein, give us an expansion down here. And we can again start to see our pairs here and we can just continue our line right over here. And we get four to seven, four to five, three to six over here. I'll go and keep drawing my lines. Three to five. And it's a little hard to see over here, but if we carefully look and look for our symmetrical disposal around the axis, we get our two to seven and one to six. And finally, right here, we get our one to two. And that, is gonna give us everything that we need to start to build up the skeleton. And I just wanna get you started on this on the whiteboard. And then I wanna take two minutes to show you some, 
some molecular models. So at this point, I'm gonna to go to the whiteboard and show you what that spectrum has given us because I think it's, it's pretty cool. And remember, one and two were way downfield, about 170 parts per million. So if we're looking for some places to put oxygens, we really are there. Those are going to have the oxygens. So we have our C3, which was a quat, and our C3 was connected to carbon-8, which was a methine, and our carbon eight was connected to carbon nine, which was a methyl group. And our C3 was connected to carbon number five that had a hydrogen attached. And carbon number five was attached to carbon number four that had a hydrogen attached. Carbon number four was attached to carbon number seven that had a hydrogen attached. Carbon number seven was connected to carbon number two that was a quat, where, well, you'll see in a moment, we have no place else to put our oxygens other than carbon one and carbon two. Carbon one was also a quat. Those are the two that are down at about 170 parts per million or thereabouts. Carbon number one was connected to carbon number six that has a hydrogen attached. Carbon number six was connected to carbon number three. In other words, you get the entire skeleton out of this. And the only places we have left to put our oxygens are on those downfield carbons. And when push comes to shove, At that point, you're left basically saying, okay, we've got to put in some double bonds. We can do this tautomer, or we can do this tautomer, and regardless of which tautomer you do, you're at that right skeleton, you filled all your valencies. I'm not sure which tautomer it is. It's, you'll notice, first of all, in a compound like this, in a, in a cyclohepta trienone, you have essentially aromaticity if you have your carbonyl polarized with a plus and a minus. That in part explains the frequency of the carbonyl. And you're also well set up for internal hydrogen bonding over here. So I can draw this perhaps more realistically here. That probably explains some of our IR. Well, you're going to rework this problem on your own, but I wanted to guide you through it a first time because every, every group that I know has worked this has, has always struggled with this problem. And I wanted to give you a little bit of a preview, perhaps a little bit too much of a preview of it. So I don't want to, at this point, take any questions on this because I think it's sort of your turn at this point to work, to work this problem um, and to look at the data for yourself. What I want to do in the very last couple of minutes is share my, my screen with you and what I want to do is show you, because this will be helpful for the homework set, show you a page on the website that I linked to. And basically it's on our pages and it's on our class materials. James has already shown you this. And I have some templates of molecular models uh, that can be downloaded to help you start to look at various structures. I've just drawn them in conformationally realistic modes as methylcyclohexane. I then went ahead and basically chopped off the end to give a methylcyclopentane. 
or added another carbon to give a methyl cycloheptane. Now these rings can flip around, so it's a little bit of an oversimplification. I've drawn a bicyclo 2 to 1 heptane. So honestly, if you can draw methyl cyclohexane and you can draw bicyclo uh, 2 to 1 heptane, you can draw norbornane, you can draw anything else just by, by faking it at the whiteboard. I've also put in some decalin, some cis and trans decalin. And I'll just show you, you can download any of these these structures and they're great templates for things that you might want to get get started with so here are our here are our downloads of them and depending on how your pi pi mole is set up you can probably go directly in to this structure here and use it as a building block for anything you want now there's a little bit of a cheat on the bicycloheptane uh, is depending on what's going on at this position on the bicyclo, I'm sorry, uh, octane, three, two, one octane on your three carbon bridge, depending on what's going on sterically, this ring could either be a chair or it could be a boat because you're gonna have a transangular interaction. But we have some nice templates. It can be very helpful to be able to use these for starters as starting points on all your various problems that you're working on. So remember, for example, our stereochemical determination on a bicyclo 311 heptane, uh, and I said, make some models. This is a template for a starting point where you can go ahead and build up some models. Here's another example where no matter what, you've got an embedded boat. And so this three carbon bridge can either flip down or it can flip up basically one boat or the other, no matter what, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Anyway, these are some very good starting points. Transdecalins are another common structure we're going to encounter in the course sometimes in some more sophisticated structures. We've already encountered trans and cis decalins in some of our modeling exercises. And I thought it was nice to be able to, to give you some templates for these. It's also great to be able to, to get in the habit of visualizing them. And remember, decalin, cis dec, trans decalin is locked Cisdecalin can go in either of two flips, ring flips, uh, for it. So these are these are some starting points to help you out with some downloadable both PSE files, and if you have trouble with the PSE files, you can download the PDB files. So I think at that I'm going to stop. Oh yeah, one last thing I'll say is in order to integrate the relationship between visualizing three-dimensional structures and figuring out structure and stereochemistry, as we move into the last problems in the course, there's going to be an assignment with each problem of actually building a model uh, for it. These are the you know, more recent so-called exam problems, building a model and going ahead and looking at that model. So often I'll give say four possible diastereomers, or maybe I'll even be thinking this year of four possible regioisomers and say, can we figure out using NMR which diastereomer or which regioisomer we have? So I know I've run a little bit long. I'm happy to stick around for questions on anything, either the inadequate or the modeling or anything else, but I'm also happy to let anyone go who wants a little break before the next class. So with the stereochemistry assignments, that's like mostly gonna be NOE, right? Mostly NOEs, but <clears throat> remember, we also started with J values. And so J values can be incredibly valuable for particularly like a six-membered ring, like a cyclohexane ring. Um, 
later on in the course, we have one really beautiful problem. I think it's in the final week of the class. It may be in the current homework. Uh, it's a seven-membered ring. And the seven-membered ring, basically, this is, this is what I'm talking about. So when I'm sort of saying I can draw two things and everything else I can kind of fake, here's what I, here's what I mean, and this is where it relates to the seven-membered ring. So I can draw, I'm no, no artist, but I can draw reasonably well a cyclohexane. If I want to be a little artistic, I can break, break my back lines here to show some depth. And I can fake a cycloheptane that's in a similar conformation. And you notice then we can start to finagle the positions of the hydrogens. So to give you a little bit of a preview on a problem that you're going to get where you have a substituent here, and I won't say any more, you're going to see off of these hydrogens, I should have just offset this a hair, I will kind of, faking it, we're going to see some gigantic, and I don't remember if we have a substituent here, but we're going to see some really big J's. And then also, we're going to get to see this beautiful locus of NOEs. And ditto off of some of the other hydrogens where we're going to have both the J values and the NOEs sort of hinting at this conformation of the molecule. So it's a, a pretty good, good way to look at it using J values as well as NOEs. And of course the J values we talked about say in our cyclohexane might be that this hydrogen might look kind of like a quartet with some extra splittings on it if we have, uh, say, three big couplings plus a, a geminal coupling. So that might be four big couplings. And we're going to see similar things here. And remember when I talked about, say, even something like, um, like this cis and trans tert-butyl uh, tert cyclohexanol, just from the patterns that these two hydrogens adopted in their splitting, we were immediately able to say, oh, this hydrogen's axial, this hydrogen's equatorial, and able to assign the stereochemistry. So NOEs can be very helpful, but coupling constants shouldn't be forgotten.